Let me show you a chromatic exercise that covers the entire range of the instrument, fast and efficient. It's like six minute abs for a saxophone, but this actually works. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do consider subscribing and hit the like button. Sure would mean a lot to old Wally. Now, today we're talking about the chromatic scale, and I've got a great exercise that's in our free PDF. It's actually part of our fundamentals book. I'll put a link down below. You can download for free, of course. And we're going to cover some exercises and some strategies to get you playing the chromatic scale very well that have huge applications in your playing. First things first, let's check out the entire exercise. It's an alternating ascending and descending motion covering the entire range of the saxophone. Spare no expense. Let's take a listen, and then I'm going to give you some strategies and a word of warning. Now, why do we want to practice the chromatic scale? Well, chromatic motions are found everywhere, from Alexander Glazunov to Charlie Parker, Flight of the Bumblebee to Donnelly. We see these motions, though maybe not in their entirety like this exercise, quite often. And this is a great vehicle. It's a vehicle for training, for practicing these alternate, highly efficient fingerings. I don't even like using the term alternate fingerings, because in these contexts, they're not alternate fingerings. They're just highly efficient fingerings. So let's dive in and talk about which fingers we should use and where and how to practice them. So in the breakdown today, anytime you see a little S, that's going to indicate a side key. And let's start with the side F sharp key. Now we simply depress the side F sharp key by holding our F key and using this little key right here known as the side F sharp key. Now, inevitably, someone wants to call it a fork key, and I've had some people get very upset with me that I don't call it a fork key. Fork fingerings, where you have a closed tone hole, open tone hole, closed tone hole, harkens back to the days of recorder. That's how you get an intermediate pitch between two notes with a fork fingering. I think they use it on bassoon, but who cares what bassoonists do? On the saxophone, this is not closed, open, closed. This is closed, opening another key. And we're opening a key on the side of our saxophone. And that key is an F sharp, hence side F sharp key. We cool with that? All right, let's listen to this little practice pattern slowly and notice where I'm using the side F sharp key. So the side F sharp key is going to be hit with our ring finger. We don't need to greatly alter our hand. That finger just comes up ever so slightly, and you should keep your hand relaxed in the neutral playing position. Next up, side B flat. Let's listen to the next sub exercise in our training. And here we transition from B flat to B using the side B flat fingering. Now we call this RSK or right side key. That's the, the abbreviation of one, RSK one is your side B flat key. And the American system that I use that I find quite logical and easy to explain is these are your right side keys because they're on the right side of your instrument hit with the right hand, right side key, one, two, three, one is the B flat because it's the first we count from the bottom up. Now you may be wondering at this point, why not the biz key? What about the side B flat? These are chromatic fingering trainings. These are the most efficient not just in my opinion, but if you go to any conservatory across the world, it's more than likely they're going to be teaching these fingerings in these contexts. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take out $80,000 in debt and go study at a university at a school of music. I'd like to save you that time and money. But here's the thing. You're adults. You can make your own decisions on reverse mortgages or gluten-free cookies. I'm not here to talk you out of it. I'm just here to give you some free information. You can do whatever you want. I recommend these fingerings. If you don't want to use them, we're cool. I just don't want to argue about it. I'd rather go practice. 
Side C, next sub exercises, transitions from B natural to C and on to C sharp. Here we use RSK or right side key two, counting from the bottom, one, is our B flat, two. While holding the B, we add RSK or the right side key number two, also known as your side C key. Take a listen to the exercise, this sub exercise slowly, then quickly. Now here's the danger for a lot of students unfamiliar with these fingerings. They like to try to karate chop, or actually I think it's a ridge hand in martial arts, the side of their instrument. We don't wanna do that. We don't need to turn up our entire hand to hit that. We can keep the natural playing position and just slightly shift the relaxed hand up and hit it. Now personally, I hit it with about that first knuckle closest to the meaty part, meaty part of my hand. I don't know why I just said that. Uh, closest to the flat of my, I have the first knuckle on my index finger is where it hits comfortably for me, but obviously we have different sized hands, you and I, unless you're my twin that I don't know about, then we might have the same sized hands, but you're gonna need to hit where it feels comfortable from you, but just a slight shifting motion. But again, not doing a ridge hand or a karate chop. Now the next sub exercise is working the palm keys or what we call in academia land, in America at least, the left side keys because you with me? All right, the left side of the horn hitting with the left, excuse me, not hitting, pressing with the left hand. And we count from what you may know as D is LSK one, two, and three. So these need a little bit of extra attention slowly and repetitively to get these smooth and relaxed. Try to keep your left hand relaxed as you work on this next subset of exercises. Let's listen to it slowly and then quickly. So practice these sub exercises before you dig into the entire enchilada, this large chromatic motion. We wanna isolate and repeat. That's the path to mastery. So let's talk about some strategies when you're practicing this to set you up for success. Number one, little chunks. That's gonna be the name of my dog food if I ever come out with one. Little chunks of practice each day. Isolate and repeat. Don't try to do the whole thing. In one given week, you might just work on one of these subsets of exercises. That's fine. There's no prize for finishing the entire exercise. I'm not gonna mail you a certificate. Well, no, no, I'm not gonna mail you a certificate. So do this for training, which means it doesn't matter if it takes you six months to get through the entire motion, work on subsets aiming for mastery as we use these efficient side key fingerings. Number two, start slow and always, always with the metronome lining up so you land on the beats. Do ba do ba da, do ba do ba da, do ba do ba da, do ba do ba do ba do ba da. We always want to make sure we're landing on the beat to confirm that we've placed it correctly within the beat. So slow with the metronome. Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. Eventually. Number three, use a mirror or a camera and record yourself when you're practicing these. You can get into very bad habits without realizing it, using way too much excess hand or arm motion, tensing the shoulder. Now, a lot of us here are adults. A lot of us here aren't young adults, so we need to take care of our bodies. Tension is going to play a large part in repetitive use injuries. We want to be as relaxed as possible. Remember, it takes very little pressure to press these keys. I accidentally press them all the time, as you probably do as well. It takes very little pressure. We wanna use the least amount of motion necessary and the least amount of pressure necessary. So watch yourself in a mirror, or better yet, record yourself and see, are you doing the karate chop? Are you tensing up? Are you moving your hand far more than you need to? That's why we isolate. So you're not worrying about the entire thing. You can worry just about RSK1 or RSK2 and isolating that individual hand movement. But watch yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Is that what the kids say? Eric, what do the kids say? Number four, once you have this mastered, which may take many months, the entire full range exercise, dust it off once a week. Keep it under your fingers. Full disclosure, I haven't practiced the chromatic scale in decades, likely, but I paid my dues back in the day. I have this so ingrained that these side and, uh, not alternate, but these efficient chromatic fingerings are second nature to me. I paid my dues and now I have this learned and I have this in my toolkit. I want the same for you. So you may have to practice this daily, then brush off weekly, then eventually it's something you won't really have to think about, hopefully. So 
don't forget about it completely until it's completely mastered, and then you'll end up practicing it in context if you're playing bebop or that little movement in the glazenoff with that great chromatic. I'll, I'll post a link down below so you can check out what I'm talking about. Now, you've got the tools, you've got the strategies. It's time to put it into action. I can't practice for you. Well, I could, but it's going to cost you a lot. You can't afford it. But you should probably do it yourself. So here's what I want you to do. Get out your metronome, set a goal of maybe just one of the sub-exercises, one line of this full range motion, and practice it for this week. Then the next week, make it additive. So, it's spring here in North Carolina. The, the leaves are coming out. It's looking really beautiful. I hope you're having a fantastic spring day wherever you are, as long as you go practice. Go practice.